Hey everybody, welcome back. Picking up where we left off from the last video, I believe it was the 1113 Very Rushed Midweek Update, where I was questioning how much more weight this little cart was going to hold since 1113's engine has gradually been getting heavier and heavier all the time. And in that last video, I was busy fabricating the new stand, or the new heavy-duty cart, whatever you want to call it, that will hold 1113's engine once it is flipped over while well, the fabrication is complete. Uh, laid out here kind of in kit form, lots of fasteners, nuts and bolts. I do prefer to bolt things together as opposed to welding them because then I can take these pieces back apart, possibly use them for something else someday instead of a welded structure that is what it is and you can't even break it down to uh, store it any better. And you will notice paint. Let me explain. Um, I know the question now is going to come up in the comment section like, Squatch, why did you paint the stand if you're not going to paint the engine? It's honestly not to spark controversy. It's just kind of standard practice around here when we build anything that's going to be used for shop equipment, tools, what have you. Uh, it kind of lends to the whole reason that we bolt things together rather than just weld them. Uh, when we're done with this under 1113, we're going to take it all back apart, store it away in the shipping container, and the gray paint on these is going to immediately, at a glance, differentiate these pieces is from just the rest of the general working steel down there that's never been drilled cut you know ground basically turned into anything um, you can just go down there and if we got a whole stack of pieces that are this gray color oh yeah that's uh, that's that old stand that's right and then we'll just you know choose a piece from somewhere else to do the project that we're trying to do um, just kind of protects these pieces from getting chopped in half and used for something else and then after the fact you're like oh man that was part of that stand and uh, like I said, we like bolting things together whenever possible, as opposed to welding them solid because, you know, once we take these back apart, um, we might be able to repurpose, you know, like we got two nice good base pieces here that already have a bolt pattern in each end for casters like this. So if we add a few more holes, we can repurpose them to be, you know, a stand for something else. It's just kind of, it's more work up front you know, bolting rather than welding, but in the long run, it actually makes life easier. And like I said, like all these pieces of uh, channel, C-channel, were re, uh, reclaimed, repurposed steel. That's why you got some grinder marks in these and the odd torched holes. You know, this was just some uh, material I had sitting around for a while and finally found a good use uh, for it. So that's the reason why we've got some nice shiny paint on there. Plus the people that do like the, you know, attractive luster of a freshly coated, nice, clean surface finish, well, then, you know, they can have something that they can appreciate looking at as well. So there's that. So since we still have to put that big, heavy bell housing on the back of the engine in order to utilize that fancy new heavy duty cart, and there's the bell housing there, all hundred pounds of it. What do we do about this rather light duty one that the engine is on now? Well, like any good redneck, I just put more axles under it. <laughs> it's uh. It's not ideal, but I, I do believe it's going to be a more than adequate uh, stopgap measure. I got a lot of these uh, these style carts. They're all the same. So I just uh, drilled and bolted each side cart onto the middle one. So we're bolted here. Then I just uh, ran these uh, heavier uh, channels underneath that go under all three. I did just C-clamp those out on each end. I know it's not a permanent attachment by any means. But if that poor uh, middle cart decides it's uh, it's about ready to give everything up, it should get caught by uh, one or both of those other ones. So that does make me feel a lot better about, like I said, making this thing gain about another 100 pounds today. As for that big bell housing, here it is right here. Like I said, it uh, cleaned up and checked out. Everything looks good. Not a lot to it. Uh, we have this O-ring right here. Goes in this groove and that seals the water outlet that is on the back of the diesel block uh, where that channel goes into the bell housing and up here through this uh, opening here into the base of the starting engine. Of course, the starting engine bolts on this area here. This is the top of it. So number four, that seal from CAT. 5M5860, that is the current number for that, so we're good there. And we have nine different 5 8 bolts that hold the bell housing to the engine block. Those bolts have four fold-over locks that go under them. We have two of the 4B4220 locks, and then we have one of the 4B4221s. Now, this is a big triple lock, but it's kind of important to replace this because this tab on the side is a uh, pointer for uh, uh, marks that are on the flywheel 
that is used for setting your uh, fuel injection timing. And I've always been kind of nervous about this because whenever you tighten the three bolts down in here, it always distorts the slock a little bit. And I've always wondered how much it really moves that pointer. Uh, <laughs> they seem to work though. So again, it's really important to uh, to get a brand new one under there. And then we have this last one, say 4B4222. That is the last fold over lock for those big 5.8s. Um, another four of the half inch by 13 bolts that go in these holes here to the back of the oil pan. And then we have this plug goes in the bottom. It's more for draining out accumulated oil that uh, that uh, builds up in there. We'll get into that a little bit later. That has the standard uh, 0L1124 gasket under that, just like the drain plug on the oil pan. The only other thing to mention now is this raised boss right here. That is for optional direct electric start. A hole would be bored in the middle for the nose cone to pass through and then uh, smaller holes would be drilled and tapped for the three mounting bolts that would hold the starter to the bell housing. Um, some people would say this is the time to get that drilled and have those uh, holes put in and tapped so you can cover it off with a plate and it's there and it's in place if you ever choose to use it. Personally, I just leave those alone because I'm a starting engine guy. I, uh, I personally like the starting engines. There are very distinct opinions uh, both ways on this. Granted, uh, each one comes with its positives and its drawbacks. Um, direct electric is a lot more convenient. You do not have an additional starting engine to have to maintain and provide fuel for and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but starting engines also have benefits, namely the ability to crank that diesel engine for as long as you want. Under full compression, under no compression, uh, you can prime fuel systems a lot easier. You can't do all that with direct electric start. So, you know, there's, there's benefits each way, there's drawbacks each way. Each way personally you well I can tell you 99.9% .9 probability you're never gonna see a direct electric conversion done on this channel I just like the starting engines my opinion only what I do know about the direct electrics is only from what I've gathered from reading forums and you know talking to people I've never really had any experience with them I believe a Delco 42 MT starter is what fits I think you have to get a special drive to engage with the ring gear um, initially, the solenoid on the starter is going to want to clock, clock in about this area right here, which would put it outside of that uh, side panel, and it's in danger of the tracks bringing debris around and damaging the starter. You can re-clock the motor so that the solenoid is down here and protected a little bit more. You can also run direct electric in conjunction with the starting engine. Uh, it just gets a little bit crowded though because on a typical conversion, the starting engine would come off the top, your coolant passages would get blocked off, and that's where your battery tray would go, sit right behind the engine block. So if you're gonna retain the starting engine and the pinion drive, the electric start's gonna be down below that, and your fender space starts getting a little bit full because that's about the only other place you can put the batteries. Now, that's about all I know about direct electric start. And again, you're probably never gonna see it on this channel anyway. So uh, let's get this bolted on. All right, ready to install, and the uh, O-ring is in place. Uh, use your favorite type of goop to, uh, to stick it in there so that it can't pop out. Line this on the dowels. There we go. First, I'm going to start these uh, bolts up at the top just so that uh, we get a bite on it and it can't fall off. Starting the interior bolts now, we got one, two with the lock already positioned, three, four again with the lock under them, five, six, and the last three, seven, eight, and nine. Like I said, on that big triple lock and that's the one that has the pointer on it, so you want to be very careful when you're running those bolts down onto that. Trying to do this with one hand is, uh, is kind of fun, rather amusing, I suppose. Get all three of those at least started anyway. And now you can see where this little pointer sticks out. It is in register with this window right here. That's where you would look in, and as you crank the flywheel around, you'll have a scribe line that lines up with the flat edge of that pointer. So, like I said, making sure that you don't distort that too badly when you tighten those bolts down is key. I might even try a little bit of oil underneath the heads of the bolts just to get them to turn on there a little easier so it doesn't want to bite and, and twist it so bad. Okay, everybody, all the bolts tightened in well, and I got all the lock tabs folded right over. Ended up pretty happy with it. Uh, didn't distort my pointer at all, so I'm also pretty happy with that. Got that side tab folded up just nice. 
the ends came in right where I wanted them. Happy with that. One thing I forgot to mention earlier was uh, about midway through the J-Series production, they uh, abandoned these bolts in the bell housing and went to studs that had uh, nuts on them. Um, I think I found that, yep, at serial number 5J5789. You can see the studs that they went to back there instead of the bolts. And I think the reason behind that is uh, every time you run a bolt out of a threaded hole and run it back in, you degrade the quality of the threads in that hole somewhat. So uh, workaround is to put a stud in there. So in theory, the stud rarely ever has to be pulled out of the block. And every time you pull the nut off the stud and put that back on, you're just wearing out the stud. You're not wearing out the block. So that's usually why they, uh, they do that. So next we'll look around here. There's a little window. You can see our pointer in here. That's where you would look to align the uh, uh, marks that are on the flywheel for setting your injection timing. That little cover is held on by a couple of uh, 3 8 bolts. We'll just uh, start those, leave those hand tight for now because we're going to be back into that in a bit. And we got the four bolts at the top tight. So to round it out, we will put the plug in the bottom of the bell housing. Now, old trick that uh, has been done for years and years. Since these housings accumulate oil because you have a rear main with no seal and you're also lubricating the uh, throwout bearing for the main clutch, a certain amount of oil will accumulate down in the bottom of these compartments. And instead of having to pull the plug out and drain it all the time, an old trick is to drill a hole in it and fit a cotter pin in there loosely so that it can rattle around. It lets the uh, accumulated oil drip out on its own, plus that cotter pin rattling in there helps to keep that hole from plugging up with, uh, with clutch material or just plain grease or what have you. So they already had a hole drilled in 1113's old plug. They did not have a pin, so I just added a cotter pin in there. And we'll get the new gasket put on it because why not? We've got plenty of them. Get that started. First try, you know, look at this. See, that's, oh yeah, there we go, there we go. And we'll tighten that in and then we'll be good. Now, if you're gonna operate in deep water, deep mud, what have you, that it may be up to the bell housing surface, you don't wanna have a plug with a hole in. You'd wanna put a solid one in there so that water and mud, whatever, cannot get inside. But I don't think we're gonna be doing too much for off-roading with old 1113. Well, that made it look a lot bigger. Wasn't uh, too bad of an installation. Nothing really gave any problems at all. So, uh, next episode, guys, we're going to give it the big flip. It's time to get that right side up. Then we'll get that new stand on there. And then the next phase begins, starting to uh, assemble the top end. Um, it's going to be a couple days before we attempt that. i got to let all those pieces dry. They're still a little bit soft, so we're going to give that paint another couple days. Thanks for watching, everybody. Hope to see you back again. Okay, bonus footage time. I made me curious about what that weighs, so I went and got the bathroom scale because this is about the only thing I ever use it for. And I put a couple pieces of wood on there so as not to annihilate it. Zeroed out. Let's see what that thing is. I've been estimating 100 pounds. We shall see. Set it down easy so I don't break anything. Let's have a look. We've got, oh yeah, 130. Heck yeah, it's a little heavier than I thought. Nice.